So let's close out this discussion on resources by focusing for just a few minutes on human resources. The whole chapter four of this textbook is a very interesting discussion of mainly social and human capital. It's unique to this textbook. Most strategy textbooks don't talk about it. As I said in the intro, uh, I know that you probably talked about that in Chuck Boltina's class. And I'm not going to go too much into it, but I do want to talk about the strategic uh, questions involved. So very quickly, what is human capital? Human capital is what the individual can do. So this is what an individual engineer can do writing software at Google or Apple or Microsoft. What is their capability? Uh, and then you see on the slide, it talks about for companies, their job is to recruit human capital, develop human capital, and then retain it. The recruit and retain are pretty uh, stock. It's the develop that is sometimes interesting. Uh, what are companies willing to do? This is often through sending them to training courses, paying tuition. Some of you perhaps in your MBA program are getting employer support. Those sorts of things are the developing human capital. Social capital is different though, and social if social if if human capital, sorry, is what you know, social capital is who do you know and what can you get through that knowledge. Let me illustrate it for you. Shortly before I retired from the Air Force, I had a very sharp guy that was working for me, and he was in the assignment flow for the Air Force. The Air Force had a very had developed a very structured assignment flow. And he had been categorized for kind of a middle third quality job. So he wasn't in the top third, he wasn't in the bottom third, it was kind of a middle third quality job. But we were trying to get him not an elite job, but one that the system classified as an upper third. And he was just basically being told, you, you, you know, you can put down that you're interested in those jobs, but we're not going to look at matching you because the central board scored you for a middle third kind of job. And so I called the assignment officer uh, at the headquarters in San Antonio and said, it was a relatively new system at the time that they were doing this. I said, well, I don't agree with your categorization. What can I do to get it changed? And he goes, well, the only way you can get it changed is go to the board president of the person who scored all these records. It was a central board that convened to score all these records and get him to agree that he deserves a better assignment. And I said, okay, well, who's the board president? Turns out it was an old friend of mine. So magically, I call the board president and say, this guy really is worthy. This is what you missed in his record. He deserves this higher ranking. Bam, he gets recategorized, and he gets off on the assignment that he wants. And all of his friends are mystified because they're all talking by email going, oh, this is what I'm going to get. You know, I'm not getting the options. They're telling me this is what I'm going to take. And, and they're like, how do you have options? How did you get a chance to get to that job? It boiled down to, who did I know? So that's the way social capital works. In Here's the strategic, strategic question. Can you have too much human or social capital from a firm perspective? The reflexive answer is, well, of course not. The more human capital and social capital I have, it's a greater resource and the more I can do with it. But probably a realistic answer is yes, you can. Now here's an easy, quick uh, illustration. Uh, I am friends with one of the gentlemen that owns several of the McDonald's restaurants in town. Imagine that he was going to open a new McDonald's restaurant and I say, you know what, I can hook you up with all these recent uh, MBA graduates to work in your store. Uh, is that going to work? You all have a lot of human capital. It's not going to work for one of two reasons. Either you're going to, he's not going to pay you what you're worth, he's going to pay you what McDonald's pays people to make a profit, and you're going to be very dissatisfied because you're not making any money, or he's going to pay you what you're worth, but he's not using those talents, and he's going to lose money in the process. Likewise, from that gross example, firms have to worry about, do they really have their human capital matched to their requirements? Because hum true human capital is expensive. Um, it costs money to, 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 to recruit it to develop it and to retain it. So if you have excess human capital, quote unquote, it's expensive. Is that a good investment? That's a balancing act. Likewise for social capital. Social capital is very expensive for firms to develop. How do they develop social capital? Well, for one thing, they move people around a lot inside the firm. So you have an active transfer policy. Every time you do that, you incur the expense of a geographic relocation if, it, if you have to move locations. And if you just take someone out of a job that they're performing very well with a set of colleagues that they know, put them into an entirely new job with colleagues they don't know, 
it's going to be great to develop their human capital and also their social capital, but there's going to be a loss of effectiveness uh, associated with that transfer where it's going to take this person time to spin up to speed and to learn this stuff. So this company is going to suffer a short-term hit. Uh, so social capital is very expensive. Uh, if you're a small business person, how many chamber networking events do you go to? How many kind of pro bono things are you willing to do to develop social capital because you realize it's costing you money? So it's easy to say, I want more, 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 but it's expensive and you're going to end up having to put it in the places where it matters the most. Now let's talk personally for just a minute. You are your personal resource. You already know that because you invested in an MBA program. Now you've got to go out and try to take this human capital investment that you've made and make it pay off. Here's uh, on the chart is a list I pulled from I took two lists and kind of averaged them, if you will. <clears throat> These are companies that have a reputation for developing human and social capital. It's interesting to me that, that as of yet, you don't see many of the, the high-tech kind of uh, newer companies come online. You see Verizon, which is you know a, an old line telecom, but, but very much into the wireless industry and all that goes with that. Some of these are, are very technology-driven companies like Boeing, for example, but they're in well-established uh, product lines. But you have to think about, uh, as you go to work for a company, are they developing my human capital? Are they helping me develop social capital? Will I be able to use it? And if the answer is no, then my advice to you is you need to start looking elsewhere. And the companies that are on this list are good starting points. If someone were to come to me and say, I really have a desire to work for a large corporation and I really have a desire to progress, these are the companies that I would recommend you apply to. One final point. Uh, the textbook at the end of the chapter talks about the balanced scorecard. I want you to be familiar with it. The whole idea of the balanced scorecard is to uh, complement or to balance the strictly short-term financial perspective. In other words, what did you make last quarter? What did you make last year? And so to do that, they try to bring in some forward-looking measures, customer perspective, what do customers say about you? How passionately do they feel about your product and your company? Uh, internal business perspective. Are you driving out cost? Are you increasing uh, your human and social capital in a cost-effective manner? Are you increasing the efficiency of your workforce? And then innovation and learning. Are you setting the stage for future success? Incidentally, this is a tricky one to measure. Do you measure how many classes you send people to? that might not be a very good metric because then all people do is go to more classes. Is the company getting any payoff? Some companies have tried to count patents. That hasn't proven all that successful either because now you see people patenting stuff and the patent office will, will patent relatively uh, useless, uh, will, will issue relatively useless patents. So people are getting a lot of patents but is it translating into new business? So for example, 3M measures how many, uh, what percentage of their revenues based on products that have been patented in the past five years. And even that can be deceptive because what if you just did this really small change? So you say it's a new patent, but the product is essentially unchanged. So you can game that system too. And then there is the financial is a part of the balance scorecard, but you have to understand it's a lagging indicator. Uh, all of these things that are above it are more likely going to have an impact at some point in the future the financial scorecard, the financial aspect is what have you done in the past. So to sum it up, we've talked about the value chain, something we're going to keep coming back to. We've talked about the internal analysis and valuable, rare, hard to imitate and organized, and how you take that and you translate that into core competencies, and then does it really lead to a competitive advantage? And I've tried to let you think about this idea of resources a little bit personally. In our next topic, we are going to actually start to look at firms' basic business strategies. Now that we have an external analysis, st uh, strengths, I'm sorry, opportunities and threats, internal analysis, strengths and weaknesses, now what is our firm going to go do? Look forward to that topic in the weeks ahead.